summer sipping ciders. Yay. We, got, we, we got some fruit shirts over there. Yeah, festive attire. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> Surprise guest appearance by Scott Katzma. Hi, Scott. Hi. Thanks for joining. Turn this waiting room off here. <clears throat> People can just come on in. Hello, everyone. Oh my gosh. We're doing a little virtual summer vacation. Oh, look, Jean and Helen have their bananas on too. <laughs> <laughs> We're all bringing bananas to the apple and pear party. <laughs> and blood orange and grapefruit and jalapeno. Yeah. All right, but I have to take the sunglasses off because I can't. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys are seeing the reflection of the, the computer screens in our eyes. Thanks so much for being here, guys. We're really yeah. excited to share these delicious ciders tonight and uh, get you excited for when you can go out and enjoy them in the, the real world. And have summer vacation for real, where yeah. we can bring our cans of cider out to the beach and all that fun stuff. So We got our paddle boards out, our pineapple. Yeah, we're ready. We're going to pull down an umbrella to... Right. We're itching. We're itching for some vacation time. <laughs> so we decided to do it here. Yep. Um, all right, so let's get started. We have a nice amount of people to kick us off here, and I know there's always people who are kind of joining as we go. I'm going to throw a poll up um, to get a sense of kind of where you stand with cider, if you've had Hemley or Seattle Cider Company before. Um, and Mara and um, Sarah, if you can give us a wave so we know who our makers are who are with us here tonight. There we go. Yes. Thanks. So Mara and Scott <laughs> are here. I'm just the marketer, but <laughs> it's my job to talk about cider, so this seemed like a good fit. <laughs> awesome. Definitely. And Mara, you said Scott was joining you. Am I getting his name right? Yeah, this is Scott Katzma. He um, was our he was our head cider maker, and now actually um, we've since, because he's amazing, promoted him to our director of innovation and fermentation, which cool. is maybe the best title ever. Yeah, that's great. And well deserved because he comes up with some really cool stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, and then we have Sarah from Hemley as well. So we'll be letting them do lots of the talking tonight and mm -hmm, tell you mm -hmm. all about their delicious ciders and brands. Um, but before we do, for those of you who are new, um, I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of The Crafty Cast. And I'm Evan, uh, bespoke wine tour guide, uh, certified sommelier, cider professional. Yes. And together we've uh, joined forces uh, to create these virtual tasting experiences to continue promoting the small craft producers that uh, we love and uh, and supported before we couldn't be out in the real world doing it and now continuing to do so virtually. Yeah, absolutely. So as you're joining, we'd love to know where you're joining us from um, and what you're sipping on. Uh, that's always fun to see what everyone's sipping on. And like I said, we threw a poll up there so we can get to know you guys a little bit. Um, so we'll give you uh, the general flow of the night first. So we're going to talk just a little bit about um, the kind of general cider um, in, in general. And when we do that, you know, Mara and Scott and Sarah can definitely chime in because they know lots about cider too. So we'll kind of start at that high level, like cider, bust some myths, talk a little bit about that. Um, but before we get to that, we're going to give you some tech tips and just make sure everyone's comfortable on Zoom because we do want to make sure this is interactive. We don't want it to be just us talking or Mara talking or Sarah talking or anything like that. We want you guys to ask your questions and jump in. So we'll orient you a little bit on how to best do that. Um, and then we'll jump in and let um, Seattle Cider Company talk a little bit about their ciders. And we're going to be tasting their newest kind of blood orange sparkling hard cider, which is delicious and we're very excited about. And then their grapefruit hard cider as well. Um, and then we'll move over to Hemley and hear about their brand story, which is five generations and five generations, I think, Sarah, um, old. So it's a fascinating story and their original pear cider. And then we'll finish off with the jalapeno pear cider, which is a super fun one. Um, and if you haven't had it, it's, it's one of Evan's yeah, favorites. Really he really enjoys quite delicious. kind of hanging out with that one. So yeah. And then, you know, throughout the night, you can ask your questions and then we'll wrap up. And if we have time, we can do some Q and A. We can maybe tell you our fun story about 
why we have full banana garb and why Jean and Helen have full banana garb too. <laughs> there is a fun story there and why Evan, um, Evan's parents are here too. They have some fruit shirts on as well. So we have a fruit clothing story later if we get to it. <laughs> um, and then of course, we're gonna be picking um, some winners for if anyone's wearing their summer touristy garb, we're gonna send you some free cider. So that will be fun too. Um, yeah, do so you wanna jump in sure. to tech um, tips? So yeah, the, uh, generally the best way to enjoy these experiences is from a computer. Uh, it works fine on your phone, but uh, you can't interact quite as easily. And since hopefully that's the point, um, we would encourage you to log in and, and do this from your computer. Uh, gallery view is kind of the best way to do that. Um, if you look up in the top right hand corner, you can see a little button there that toggles between speaker Sorry. view and gallery view. Um, and uh, you can see everybody's smiling faces if you're uh, in the gallery view, uh, periodically we'll shift the view over to speaker view um, when Mara and Sarah and maybe Scott are talking, um, but feel free to click back to, to the gallery view if, you, uh, if you'd like to enjoy it that way. Um, and the chat box is a nice way to engage with people um, and kind of kibitz and make comments. Um, you can also post questions there if you have you know, something that you're curious about and don't feel comfortable speaking it yourself, but we certainly would encourage you to do so. Um, you know, it, whenever there's a lull in the conversation, if you wanna unmute yourself and chime in, if it doesn't seem like there's a lot of lulls in you uh, and you still have something you'd like to say, then there's another great way to do that. Um, there's a, a little option to raise your hand and we'll see that you've got your hand raised and then we can kind of take an opportunity when it presents itself to, to call on you and you can uh, you know, make your comment and ask your question and things like that. Um, you can also chat with people directly in there, which is great if there's something that uh, you, know, don't, you don't feel like uh, you need to share with the entire group. Um, you can also, you know, message us directly if there's a question that you'd like us to ask on your behalf. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing details um, as we're doing this about, uh, you know, where you can purchase these delicious ciders from Seattle Cider Company and from Henley Cider uh, periodically throughout the event. Uh, don't worry about grabbing them from the chat box because uh, we'll be sending out an email afterwards as well. Although um, feel free to click on them from the chat box and yeah. go buy some cider now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No time like the present. Um, and uh, for those of you who want to show your support, that's a really great way to do that. This is you know, kind of the reason why we started doing these so that uh, these, these great uh, producers can, can garner the support that they are you know, direly missing in, in many cases uh, during this period of uh, shelter in place. So um, please feel free to support uh, them in that way. And uh, if you'd like to support us, uh, you They're can- having a great time. Yeah, feel free to uh, Venmo tip your, uh, your host, Suzanne and I. Um, and we'll provide those details as well. Um, at the Crafty Cast. Yes, that's simple enough, at the Crafty Cast. Uh, so yeah, um, I guess that's kind of the main tech tips. Um, is there anything I'm omitting? I don't think so, I think those are the basics. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's jump in, yeah. shall we? Yeah, let's sure. Start talking cider. Let's chat, let's chat cider. So, um, so let's see. So we have a lot of people who love cider here. We have some who like it, it looks like. We have some people who have ha who have tried both Hemley and Seattle Cider Company, about 20% each. Um, and then some who haven't had either. So that's fun. This is a great way to kind of get to know some Yay. new producers. Um, one of the things that I really love about cider, honestly, is busting myths. So I have kind of a fun story. So I first fell in love with cider way back when I studied abroad in Spain when I was 19 or so. And I was Honestly, you know, at that age, you're just excited that you get to drink legally somewhere. Um, but cider is a really big part of the culture, especially in the Basque country where I was up in San Sebastian. Um, this blanket's actually from San Sebastian. It says San Sebastian on it. Um, and so I totally, I, that was my first introduction to cider was Spanish sidra. And Spanish sidra is very dry. It's very kind of almost like barnyardy, cheesy, a little funky. And I loved it. And they have a whole culture around it and they have certain foods they eat with it. And it was just one of my very earliest, honestly, immersive like craft alcohol experiences. And looking back on that, you know, 20 years later or whatever it is, um, that's probably one of the reasons I started the Crafty Cast was that very early stage formative experience with cider. But then fast forward when I came back to the States, which was, you know, early 2000s or so, and I started looking for cider here and there wasn't a whole lot to be had. And it was all pretty mass made and pretty big companies making it. And I was trying these ciders and I was like, gosh, why does this taste like a Jolly Rancher? Like, what is this? This is not what the cider back in you know, Spain tasted like. 
And so I kind of really fell off the cider train for a while and was really disappointed and thought it was just a fluke that like Spanish cider was good and everything else was bad. Then fast forward another five or 10 years maybe. And all of a sudden I started seeing things called Cidre on menus. I started seeing some other things that made me think maybe I should give it another try. And the craft cider revolution was here. Um, and really the craft cider revolution is going back to a lot of these older varietals of apples, these heirloom apples that have been kind of lost over history, partially from prohibition and you know them not having a real need for these cider apples anymore. Um, but for other reasons as well, grain spirits started coming in, beer started getting more popular. So it just kind of fell out of fashion. Um, and so the craft cider revolution has really been exciting because you were seeing a lot of these kind of more traditional styles of cider being made that are drier, that are more complex, not just kind of like apple juice with carbonation um, and really have personality and kind of flair to them. And tonight's a really fun example because this is now taking that craft cider revolution that was very traditional for a little while and now putting some twists on it, right? And doing it in a craft way, doing it in a way that's still authentic, that's still delicious, that's using natural ingredients and kind of letting us have this wide variety, just like we have in beer and in other areas of beverages to choose from. So if you're not in the mood for just a straight cider, you have some flavored ciders and some different things to sip on. And for summer especially, it's awesome. Um, so that's my kind yeah. of cider story. And you just recently became a certified cider professional. Yeah, that's right. So he's kind of in the cider realm as well. Yeah, I've kind of discovered cider actually in no small part due to uh, Suzanne's enthusiasm. Um, my background being in wine, I found a lot of similarities in the way uh, the flavors that you can find in ciders derive not only from, you know, the actual type of, uh, of apple that you're using, but how it's grown and where it's grown and all those kind of similarities to the, uh, you know, the variances that you find in wine, I found very compelling and uh, easy to adopt as another kind of knowledge base that I was curious about and, and really found myself enjoying uh, trying and finding examples of. So it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride and, and yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it enough that I went out and took this ridiculous test. So uh, yeah, it's been fun. Well, I teased him. So we did the whole 30 um, a few months ago and you know, there's no alcohol for a month when you do the whole 30. And when we were allowed to have alcohol again, the first thing he opened was cider. And I was like, yeah. the sommelier is choosing a bottle of cider first, a wine tour guide. Like, so I felt like that was a win. So. I had to start with something kind of low alcohol, you know? <laughs> sure, sure. Couldn't you just jump into cider. something. <laughs> <laughs> no excuses. Um, all right, um, Mara and Scott and Sarah, I'd love to just maybe if you can give some kind of high level just cider knowledge um, and just talk a little bit about cider in general with us for a little while and then we can kind of jump into Seattle Cider Company and hear a little bit about your brand story and also our guests, we'd love it if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have cider stories of your own that you want to share, um, you guys can go ahead and unmute yourselves. We just kind of tend to mute everyone a lot, except for background noise. I just told Scott I was going to defer this to him because he is the one who makes cider. Uh, like right. I said, I'm just, I get to talk about it, um, which is an awesome job as well to have. But um, if you're looking for cider knowledge, this is the one to go to. So. Nice. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you're totally right. Like, post-prohibition, like, the apples in the U.S. are pretty boring, right? They're developed to be stored in cold storage for most of the year and eaten in the grocery store or bought from the grocery store. So um, they're not necessarily the apples that uh, qualify your experience in Spain, right? They're like right. apples that are grown for the sole purpose of making absolutely phenomenal cider. And so most of the cider companies in the US, if they're not using concentrate from those apples in England or France, they're using apples that are grown here in the U.S. for uh, the grocery store. Yeah, baking, eating, snacking. Yeah, yeah exactly. All your baker saucers, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it it doesn't necessarily like give us the upper leg on the cider industry because like we're working against history right um but all that to say like 20 years later and now like they're actually following some of the trends that are happening here in the u.s so right just because of 
the apples that we have at our access here to make cider with doesn't mean that we can't use them in a way that is thoughtful or uh, considerate or there's a lot of ways that we can like work with these apples even though they aren't the, like your bitter sweets and your bitter sharps um, as long as you're giving thoughtful consideration to your yeast and all of the fermentation dynamics and you can get pretty creative and I think that's what you're seeing in the U.S. market right now. For sure. This resurgence of not necessarily bitter sweets and bitter sharps, but more thoughtful and playful ways of working with the common eating aspect. Yeah. Can you explain how do... um, bitter sweets and bitter sharps, just like what that, like, I know there's like a quadrant kind of, and there's like four different types of apples and just explain a little bit what, what those four types are. Yeah. So first we have sweets, uh, which is your common, grocery store varietal, uh, Granny Smith, or uh, sorry, Red Delicious, Gala, Fuji, Golden Delicious. Um, they're called sweets, not necessarily because of their sugar content, but because they are what people like to eat. Right. Um, they're called sweet, not because they have more sugar, but because they have a lack of acid and tannin. Um, and so you take those grocery store varietals, um, and you add a little bit of acid, those are called sharps. And that's what we uh, are, have been cooking, baking, saucing with in the US uh, for the past 80 years. Um, so those are high acid apples, but still low tannin. And then the apples that you have in Europe that are commonly grown for cider production are bitter sweets and bitter sharps. Bitter sweets have high tannin but low acid, and bitter sharps have high acid and high tannin. Uh, so those are kind of the four different um, types of apples. And bitter sweets are more commonly grown in France, uh, which is why a lot of French cider is more tannic. Uh, and lower acidity and then the bitter sharps even though they grow those everywhere including here in the US that's more qualitative of cider made in England uh, which is right. kind of a little bit of higher acid but also still tannin so was, grown in the US are mostly for the commercial market which are gonna lack both acid and tannin unless they're like Granny Smith or some of those heirloom apples like Newtown Pippin, Jonathan, Jazz, all of those. I was pretty surprised when I started learning about cider that the, the little crab apples that you find in some tree growing wild have the same amount of sugar by and large as any of the ones that you find in the grocery store, despite the fact that they taste nothing like you know what you'd expect in the grocery store. That was pretty fascinating. Sarah, um, you, you started to say something there, uh, and I'd, I'd love to you to get to get to say whatever it was, please chime in. So I gotta throw in a little bit of California love for the uh, fruit that we grow down here. So we're, we come from a little, I started cider from a little different perspective where um, my husband's sixth generation pear farmer and we also grow apples down here. The way we grow fruit in California, we're not growing them for cold storage and long-term storage. They're grown primarily for flavor and Looking back at the way that we make wine, when I started to figure out, well, how do we make a cider with this amazing fruit that we have in California, we traveled to France and um, we went to England. But like we were, Seattle cider is saying, if you take dessert fruit and you make it in the French style cider, it's going to fall flat, flat on your palate. What we lucked into was traveling down to Tasmania and we met up with some Australians. And Australia has the same kind of system that the United States does. They are a British colony, which means they like cider, uh, but they have mostly dessert fruit. Uh, and so we teamed up with what's called Willie Smith Cider. They um, take dessert fruit, they took a French cider maker. And what we do is take the highest quality fruit that we can, you press it, and then you play with it in fermentation. So malactic fermentation, blending the fruit, oak aging, and then the blend back system all gives you this ability to make an amazing cider out of the amazing fruit that we have in the United States. So it's not just using the traditional cider fruits and peri, peri pears, but 
there is a way, I think, to make amazing cider with amazing fruit, but it all does start with the fruit, just like wine. So it's really easy to start talking about cider, just like you would talk about making wine. Yeah, it, that was that was something really cool too. You know, you touched briefly on the idea that there's apples that are intended and grown to be consumed as, you know, there's an eating apple, the way that there are with grapes. And then when you look at this, certain types of apples that exist that are intended for cider, there's different types of cider that you're going to be producing using those types of apples. The same way, you know, there's red grapes and there's white grapes for making red wine and white wine. Um, there's uh, certain types of grapes that are better suited to making into a sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine, and, and as I've learned, like that's, a, that's another kind of very similar uh, feature of, of apples and apple production and cider production with the attention being placed on what kind of apples are you choosing to use and why are you choosing to use those ones, depending on the type of cider that you plan on making. It's really, yeah, kind of a fascinating parallels. I loved it. <laughs> And that's what I really love about too, whenever I meet people who are like, oh, I don't like cider. It's too sweet. It's too like, what? and I'm just like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, you know, cause there are so many different types of apples. And then when you layer in the art of the cider maker and what they do with that canvas, like there is such a variety to choose from that it's like, I guarantee you there is a cider out there that you like. Like I guarantee you just have to keep trying, you know? <laughs> and so, and that's what, you know, we like to do with things like this is get people to experience new and different types of, of, you know, um, ciders so that they can expand their palate and have another delicious tipple to include in their, in the their repertoire. rotation. Yeah. So when they're eating dinner, they have more to choose from than just like beer and wine, you yeah. know, and they can rotate other things in, which is really fun because pairing food with cider is super fun. So maybe we'll get to talk a little bit about that later, but that's a really fun kind of thing to do. Um, Quick question there for, for Sarah. Uh, the question was, you mentioned a system that sounded like Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. So Glenn Beck, that, it so it's back. essentially the way that it's been explained to me through what the English cider makers is what we're doing with making cider is we're essentially making a wine. And that process is a wine process where it's a crush and a, like a press and we've got a fermentation. Um, and the difference between what then makes it a wine into a cider is this blend back transitional. So at the end, we'll have a finished base. So we'll have a pear cider and then we want to make the jalapeno or we want to make the original pear. And what we'll do is like a, an essentially a blend back and an infusion. So then it's so you can use sugar or flavorings. Um, we use fresh pressed juice back into it and then infuse it. And then that plus the carbonation transitions it essentially from a wine, like a still wine into a cider. That's that blend back process. Okay. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Awesome. Um, well, Mara and Scott, do you want to tell us a little bit about Seattle Cider Company and that kind of the origin story and the history and the people and all that kind of fun stuff? Um, and then we can get into tasting some of your delicious ciders. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we started in 2013. We were the first cidery in Seattle post prohibition. Uh, oh. And Wait, we, what year was that? In 2013. Wow, it's crazy to think, right? That like- Seattle took a long time to- <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it's not to say that we aren't growing apples that are like commonly traditionally used for cider production, right? Like a lot of people have been doing that for a long time in Washington state. Uh, but in Seattle, no one had been making cider commercially since prohibition. Um, we are sister companies with a brewery that was founded in 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, and our founder of the brewery realized he had Crohn's disease uh, pretty early on into starting the brewery um, and decided, well, realized he couldn't drink gluten anymore. And we started making cider, not only out of that kind of um, need, but also because we realized there's nothing on the grocery store shelves that we wanted to drink. Uh, nothing that was dry and like uh, like you were saying you know all the mass-produced ciders in America were nothing like 
what we've experienced from quality cider production. Yeah. Uh, making cider. Um, and sorry, I forget the rest of your question. Just kind of about the, your brand and the brand story and, you know, who you guys are, what you guys stand for, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we're really close to apples. Um, and it makes a lot of sense uh, because 60% of the country's apples are grown, you know, a mere 120 miles away from here in the Yakima Valley. Wow, no kidding. That much of really? the apple production is Washington. I had no idea. Yeah. And we're in a good place for hops on the brewery side and then a great place for apples. Um, we also, we, you know, only source Washington apples. Who's that local connection for us. Oh, okay. Well. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, anyone who's making cider from dessert fruit in the U.S., like the odds of it coming from Washington are very good. Like even the odds of eating a Granny Smith in France probably land you somewhere within Washington state. Right. Um, and so like, yeah, we've been making cider for it's over six years now. Um, but then also recently, Washington state has come into a very um, nice resurgence of growing cider fruit and planting cider fruit as well. And just today we actually canned a sing single varietal of Ash Meets Kernel. Uh, cool. English fruit. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you have an orange story. I would just say that, um, you know, as Scott was mentioning, when we were trying to make something that, you know, we wanted to drink, for us that tends towards the drier side of cider. Um, so we talk a lot about bricks when we talk about our um, our ciders here. And, you know, bricks is just, it's used in wine, it's used in fruit to talk about the amount of sugar, essentially, that and, and perceptible sweetness, but the amount, the amount of sugar that you're gonna see in a cider. And we don't typically go very high with that at all. And so, um, you know, when we say not your standard cider, what we mean by that essentially is, you know, we're making ciders that we really enjoy and um, those tend towards the drier side. That's great. And what was your, like, what was your initial cider that you launched? Was it kind of a straight, your like, cider or did it have some flavor fun stuff going in it? Cause I know you guys do like to do a lot with the, the fun flavors. Yeah, we launched with um, four initial year rounds, uh, which are still our flagship. We launched with dry, semi-sweet, uh, gin botanical and free pepper. And gin we, botanical is fun. Yeah. All of those. So dry and semi-sweet being the flagships of our company. Sure. Um, dry is um, close to 70% of our annual production. So oh, wow. um, that's definitely a luxury of where we live and people preferring the, the drier side, but that's also what we're trying to do um, as our mission statement in, in trying to advocate for cider in the country is like pushing people towards the drier side. So sure. all of our ciders that we produce year round will be less than 2.3 bricks. Wow, okay. Yeah, it's fun. We're doing um, an event for a company in a, in a few weeks. And, you know, I suggested for one of the events that we do cider and she was kind of like, well, I think there's a lot of men in the crowd and like, you know, maybe we should do beer. And I was like, you know, I think it could be really fun to do some dry ciders and maybe throw a hopped cider in there to like really like tie it to beer a little. And so we got her on board. So we're excited to kind of like continue to have that conversation with, yeah. with people, you know, where they think like, eh, cider. And we're like, hold on, <laughs> let us show you some dry ones. Yeah, um, let me show you the way. Here's yeah, how. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking through some of the pictures here and it looks like you guys have a great tasting room. Um, and so I noticed someone on our call uh, lives in Portland, so that's not too far away. So tell us a little bit about your space and your tasting room, because I think you share it with the brewery as well, right? Yeah, um, so Scott and I are actually sitting in our production space in front of a wall of cans that um, yeah. <laughs> we get ready to can soon. Um, but we have our cider production space here. We have our beer production space. Um, we can and bottle on site and then tucked right in the middle of that is our tasting room, which we call cool. 
and because we're kind of a little off the beaten path. We are um, in the heart of Soto, which is very industrial. Um, it's, you know, one of the few places where you can get the kind of square footage that you need for the amount of production that we do. And so it's kind of nice from the tasting room. You can look through a window in the tasting room and see the cider production area. And then you can look through a window in our retail space and actually see our brewery production area too. Um, so it's just tucked right in the middle. Um, it certainly makes it really easy um, once we're making like new beers and ciders or releasing something to get them from production uh, into our tasting room. But over 30 taps, um, we are, we've been really grateful to remain open during this time. Um, Washington has uh, allowed us to do to-go orders and oh, then, you know we had to get pretty scrappy really quick um, and change up the way that we did some of our business obviously a lot of that is um, is off-premise in grocery stores convenience stores um, but we were able to pivot really quickly and um, started working with Vino Shipper um, I met Teresa at CiderCon and she was lovely and helped us get set up so now we're shipping to 38 states and then on our beer side, we actually are able to, it's beer and cider, we're able to uh, deliver direct to customer. So that's really new for us and really exciting um, and ship beer and cider within the state of Washington. So those were all really good things that I think, you know, we've been talking, actually Scott and I talked about it for a long time about, okay, when are we gonna get set up to ship to more states? And yeah. we finally had that nudge because it was finally out of necessity. Um, but it's actually been really great because then that means, you know, when we have folks, I saw someone's on here from Cottonwood, Arizona. I'm an Arizona native, by the way. Um, we could ship cider to you. Yeah. Which is also really nice because then I don't, um, you know, have to pack an extra bag when I go home to visit my mom. And <laughs> Um, I can just ship her some now. So especially since I haven't traveled to Arizona in a while and I don't know when I will next, but. Right. So yeah, I, I think that one of the, it's been a weird time obviously, but I think that one of the really like bright shining lights out of this is that there's been so much innovation in how people are doing business and how we're managing to connect in ways like this. Um, you know, Suzanne, you and I met, I think for the first time in person at, um, so right before the, Cider Summit, yeah. Yeah, and you know, we run into each other at their Cider events, and, yeah. and well, a lot of those have been postponed for a while, and so without stuff like this, or without being able to like ship to consumers, or offer takeout, um, or deliver direct to people, it would be a really different experience for us, but sure. somehow, somehow we got deemed essential, and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah Great. Um, we're looking forward to, you know, when phase two happens and we'll, uh, in Washington and we'll figure out how to manage all of that safely. And um, our leadership team actually meets um, every day for about 30 minutes to talk about contingency plans and how, sure. so just so we can be prepared. Yeah, no, it's true. I think, you know, we're hopeful too, that there, there are some good things that hopefully will come out of this. And so I, I keep joking that you know, before all of this happened, we thought we were all staying virtually connected by scrolling each other's Facebook feeds, you know, and we were like, oh yeah, I'm connected and I know what's going on with them. And now we see some of our friends more often than we normally see them, even though they live in the same city as us, because we're doing like Sunday night game nights or, you know, dinner chats on, on Zoom. And that's so much nicer than waiting until the next time we can all get in person, you know? And so I'm kind of like, I hope, I hope these continue. And we're really hoping that these virtual tasting experiences are fun and that we build a big enough audience that they want to keep doing them well into the future too, because it's a nice way to be able to visit makers from all over the country a couple times a year, instead of just when you happen to be in that city or just when you happen to go or there. Or 52 times a year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and get to learn and visit places and see what they look like and stuff like that. So, You know, for us, we are based out of Seattle we distribute in 15 states, um, but outside of Washington, we only have two of those states that have a dedicated salesperson, right. satellite salesperson. Otherwise we rely heavily on our distributors to help us get to market. And so for us, this is a great way where we're able to connect with some of the states that you know, we distribute to and to connect with people in states that we don't distribute to because you know what, like let us ship you some product and let's, let's do a tasting and you can, 
you know, ask Scott, like, what was the, you know, what was the impetus for starting sparkling or how did you decide to make that, you know, flavor combination or totally. work out? Um, and it's really nice to be able to directly connect with the makers and other cider enthusiasts. So I think a lot of this is actually really here to stay. I hope so too. I think it's a great tool and it's, yeah. and I, you know, I always tease Evan because he gives wine tours and brings people up to wine country. And I'm like, yeah, but how many of your wine guests get to actually talk to the maker and ask them their questions every time they go to the winery with you? Like true. barely ever, yeah. but this way you do, you get to like get to know someone and ask the questions. And so with that, we encourage all of you, if you have questions, ask them. Um, yeah, very much. But yeah, but speaking of you, you hinted a little bit and I certainly have the question around how you guys decided to kind of go this route because it is, you know, visibly different at the very least than your, your packaging historically. Um, and so I have my theories, but I'd love to hear the story of, you know, this, and maybe you can talk us a little through the tasting notes for people who are drinking it with us, which there are a few, and talk us a little bit through, you know, the, the blood orange first, and then we can kind of go to the grapefruit. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll have uh, Scott talk through some of the tasting notes, because I know that this has been a passion project for him that he doing research and development on for a long time. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think as a company, we've realized that we have a number of different demographics that we serve. And some folks were looking for things that were a little bit lighter ABV. Um, most of our ciders are 6.5, 6.9. Um, that's like drinking an IPA for some yeah, people. Sure. I certainly don't feel nearly as full after drinking a cider as I do an IPA. Um, and I drink a little but we had a, you know, we've noticed that there's there's been a shift and, and some folks are looking for something a little lighter ABV, lower calorie, lower carb. Um, and we knew that we could do that and that we could also at the same time make it really good. So that was sort of the why we set out on that path. Um, Can I pause for one second? We have a question from Elaine and I know Elaine, it's early in the morning over for Elaine because she is in Vietnam right now. Elaine, I just unmuted you. Go ahead with your question. Uh-oh, did we lose her? All right, we'll come back to her. Okay. Go ahead, continue. So let, let's talk, go, continue, Mara. I have, I have a question about the sparkling ciders in particular, but um, you can tell us a little bit about the, the flavors first. Yeah, we just, you know, we see some changes in the market, and I think that we're in a great um position in terms of like the talent that we have in-house to be able to pivot and try new things um, and meet our consumers where they're at but at the same time like we want to make sure that it like meets our standards and so that's really where scott comes in um and has been he's really truly been working on this liquid for quite some time to get it to where this amazing flavor is today so yeah um uh, there's definitely a trend um in the seltzer category, you know, people who are a lot more calorie conscious, low ABV, low carb, that, that fits with keto. There's a lot of there's a lot of purchasing power in consumers um, that are looking towards the health conscious side of drinking, uh, which we haven't seen ever before, and that's why you see like the a really like rise of seltzer in the last two years yeah. uh, and all of those products um, at least internally we don't really enjoy um, and so we thought like how can we do that better how do we how do we create a product um, from our apple base we don't really enjoy that is the case uh, that hits all of the same specs uh, that is even more enjoyable than just uh, a chemically infused carbonated water. Sure. Right. And so like we see a lot of opportunity there and uh, we're to make both of these sparkling products, both the blood orange and the Meyer lemon, we're taking the same base uh, that we ferment dry and semi-sweet with um, and making it, you know, 4.2% alcohol by volume instead of before the lowest we'd ever gone is 6.5. So it is 
kind of our first venture into lower ABV cider, uh, but also being a bit adjacent to the consumer who is um, trends towards buying seltzer, but making a, a, a superior product, trying to elevate the category a little. Yeah, for sure. Like it's funny when we first got these, when you guys sent them to us, I um, we opened the box, and as soon as I took it out, I was like. <laughs> oh, what is this? Oh, I, I think I know what's happening here. And, and it's very smart, I have to say, like yeah. as a marketer myself, you know, we all saw how big the sparkling seltzer kind of category went last summer. And it's really smart to have packaging that kind of looks like sparkling, you know, hard seltzer yeah. packaging and does the same thing that they're doing where it calls out the number of calories and it calls out the grams of sugar and it calls out the you know, but the fun, and so I was really interested when we first poured it into our glass, I was a little bit like, is it going to be clear? I don't know. Like, is this actually a hard seltzer? Yeah, you guys can see kind of flip up a little bit too, so you can see on the bottom. Yeah. Um, and so those of you who enjoy hard seltzer, um, you can see this, this has a very similar look and feel to it. And so I was really curious when I first poured it into my glass, like, is it going to be clear or is it going to look like cider? Like, I don't know, you yeah. know? And so it's fun because you can see here, there is like a nice kind of blood orange tint to it. Um, but what I love about them, because you know, I've certainly drank my share of hard seltzers last summer. And what I like about these is there is that like a little bit more flavor complexity and like kind of weightiness to them than the hard seltzers that kind of just feel like you're drinking soda water. Um, and so they have a little, they're a little more fun for me personally. And I mean, I feel like so many of the seltzers I found to your point, Scott, they're, some of them are like, yeah, okay, it's moderately tasty, but it's like chemically tasty. Yeah. And you're like, that tastes like a bunch of things that I have no chance of pronouncing. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think and these kind of just taste almost like cider light a little bit, which yeah. I really enjoy. I mean, I love banana Laffy Taffies, <laughs> but I know that's not like made of anything real. Right, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, these are really nice. Um, they're just like lightly flavored, which I enjoy. Kind of like those sparkling waters that have the hint of lime or something in them. And I really enjoy that it's it's definitely blood orange. You can tell it is, and it's a beautiful blood orange flavor. But it's, you know, it's light. Um, and it's very crushable, just like the hard seltzer. So definitely when we're all allowed to go out to the parks and to the beaches and everything, these are going in the bag, yeah. for sure. So the next one there, the, the grapefruit, this is the, the packaging that you've had, um, I, I would presume, since you started producing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We really have not, um, we haven't strayed much from the original uh, branding and packaging since we came out with our flagships. Um, what we end up doing too, and that's pretty indicative, it, um, we just call it by the adjunct ingredient, so you really know what you're getting. Uh, this is, you know, pretty true to style, like true to branding since the very beginning. And uh, yeah, you know, we tried to, I think from the, from the beginning, we tried to make the can iconic. Um, then we also realized that it was time for us to get out of pack tax and move into um, boxes. So these come in a, in 16 ounce cans in a four pack right now. And so even when we put them on boxes, we were like, well, how do we keep this like, iconic looking can that we've been trying so hard to create this, um, you know, really like brand recognition. So you know what you're getting. Um, we take our quality standards very seriously. And so we ended up putting the can on the box and we're like, okay, there we go. <laughs> That's our solution. There. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, the, from flavor to flavor, the packaging looks really similar except for a band of color around the bottom. And then you can see you know, do a little bit of different color here depending on the flavor, but we just call it like it is. Um, yeah. but dry and semi-sweet, we're like, well, those are ciders. There's no adjuncts added to those. Dry, we called it dry because there's zero residual sugar in there. Semi-sweet for us, we're like, okay, that's semi-sweet. And then otherwise, yeah, we just call our seasonals by what the additional ingredients are. So it's interesting. We have a question, and it's a great question, Heather, um, where you know, wine has great varieties, beer has plentiful categories, IPA, brown, porter, stout, that serve as great descriptors and kind of help people orient themselves about like, this is the style I like, this is what I'm looking for, this is what I'm in the mood for, you know, but it seems like cider just has sweet, dry, you know, and like, could it benefit from categories? And 
Mara, Sarah, you can chime in on this too if you'd like, because I know, you know, the U.S. Association of Cider Makers has really been working on this for a while, and for a little while there was kind of the heritage cider versus modern ciders, and then that wasn't really working super well. And so, you know, do you guys have thoughts on that, and maybe like why that doesn't exist for cider, and if you know you there are any styles or subsets that would be helpful for people? You know, um, you're right. Like, I, who is that from, uh, Heather? There's not really. Um, a mutually agreed upon lexicon when it comes to cider. And I think that a lot of that has to do with, I mean, there's a lot of layers to that. It's a really complex issue. And there's, you know, when we go to cider cons or other symposiums where we talk about that, um, there's not a simple cut and dry way that people want to talk about it, right? So Seattle Cider, we talk to people about bricks. Um, other folks, there's a little bit more nuance than just, you know, dry or sweet. Um, you know, there's off dry, semi sweet, semi dry. There's there's different nuance to it, but it is really hard to get folks to agree upon what that lexicon is um, and the style. And then, of course, similar with beer, you're gonna see there's um, an incredible amount of crossover between those things. And you know, when you work in an industry where the bread and butter of what you do um, comes out of this like crazy innovation, there's this like you know just constant evolution so there's not really like a great like yes or no answer like well yeah of course it'd be nice if we could um all agree on a way to talk about cider and like what you know how the flavors are brought to the table or what the level of sweetness is but then you're also taking into account um tannins acid uh, things like that 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 also affect the flavor the perceived sweetness or portrayed perceived acidity. So there's a, there's a lot. I know that Scott has a lot of feelings about this too. It's something that we talk about. So I think a, what you'll end up seeing is a lot of cideries talk about it within their own brand. So you can say, you know, from yeah. this cider to this cider, like this is going to be sweeter than this, or this is drier than this. Um, but it is sometimes difficult to compare your own ciders because of the way that you make them to others when folks haven't agreed on how to talk about that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think that the the suggestion there in um, Riley's question slash Heather's, um, <laughs> it, as far as, you know, naming ciders based on the particular types of apples that are used to create them um, belies something that's a little di different about wine from cider. And I've been talking all about how they're so similar, but it seems that from my experience in, in talking with cider makers, the viability for making cider from just one type of apple and having something that is kind of integrative and cohesive and Complex. tastes good is really challenging. There's not a lot of apple, there's a lot of apple varietals out there, but there are very few that um, cider makers in my you know anecdotal experience feel are worthwhile to make uh, as a varietal uh, cider. Whereas obviously with wine, that's very commonplace. You don't you see far more wines that are single varietal uh, than you see uh, blends, I think by and large, at least across the world. Whereas with cider, you know, maybe Kingston and there Black. Are some, yeah, Kingston Black, some of well, those. Uh, yeah. Hemley makes a great pink lady. Yeah. Um, so they exist, but I mean, Scott, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, yeah, totally. Right, right now, like we're seeing ciders or at least in the modern category of ciders being defined into like fruit whether it's cane or stone, and then uh, spiced or herbed or botanical. And so like you're taking like the, the basic fruit, which is the, fr the apples grown in America, and then that being like segregated into like your adjuncts, right? Whether okay. spices or herbs or botanicals. But I think we need to look back into wine history a little bit and like 30 years ago, sure. wine being made in the US was Concord, right? Mm -hmm. Like you weren't going to the grocery store and like looking for a Zinfandel or a Cab Sauv or a Merlot. And like, you know, you, you start like turning the page in the wine industry and now like everyone's looking after, like looking for like Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley. Um, I think we're maybe 10 years into that process in the cider industry where 
I do fully expect um, 20 years from now, you will walk into a grocery store and like be able to ask them for like, where's your bittersweet cider section? Like, where's, where's your bitter sharp cider section? Do you have any like single varietal Newtown Pippin? Do you have? Any, um, I mean, it's true of beer too, right? I mean, it used to be like, I want a beer. You it's know? ale or lager. Yeah, and now it's very <laughs> like. <a> stout. <laughs> So yeah, so you're right. It is you know the the modern cider industry at least is kind of newer yeah. you know than than some of these other industries that have really been dug in and like didn't have a fall off for a little while. So yeah. well, a lot of industry of like 20 years ago, right? And I fully expect. I, I mean, at least what I see here in Washington State and the 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 full access to cider fruit being grown, um, I I can't wait for the next 20 years of cider production in the U.S. Yeah, I think a lot of folks aren't, you know, asking for, there's a certain aspect of scalability when you're talking about single varietal ciders and like we would make more of them as a company um, if we had some, you know, if we, if we knew that we had a market to sell them to, right? So we're in that space of introducing folks to cider and then we want to get them to the ne that next space. Um, Scott and our cider production team have made some really incredible stuff. We'll be announcing here soon. I know um, he talked about we canned the Ashmead's kernel this morning. People would ask about that if they knew what it was. Right, of course. Yeah, Absolutely. take the education. Yeah. I mean, you know, an Ashmead's kernel or a Jonathan based wine or wine sap. And, so there's a level of education that has to happen. And it's hard because I don't know that we necessarily have to agree on like all of the complexities of building a lexicon for cider, but we're gonna have to agree on some in order to get to the next step. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, overall we do like, there's so many cool things happening in cider and we, miss those opportunities to tell people a deeper dive story because they you know don't know out the gate that like you know lager versus pale um sure of course once we or can like get you said, to there like, yeah all the cider in the u.s is just sweet you know? right yeah for sure hey sarah did you have something to say i thought i heard you start to cut in well it's getting back to the same point where this is all i think it all goes back to the fruit and it takes about four years to get a crop of apples and it takes about eight to get a crop of pears so that not only in the cider industry are we transitioning consumers from learning about cider and having a drier palate and getting more sophisticated but we have to bring agriculture behind us and it's really hard to bring the growers behind so in, in Washington it's amazing that it's finally happening but when you're looking at um, you know, a ton of apples selling in the fresh market for $800 and a ton of apples selling cider for 400. It's a risk to put those apples into the ground and start an industry of cider where there's no other avenue for those. So if the cider market collapses and those apples go nowhere, it's been hesitant for farmers to be con convinced that we can do that. And so that's one of those pieces of bringing those farmers up with the cider app industry so that we have the apples and the pears to have access to this amazing. And yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. I'd say like, yeah, 10 years from now, there's gonna be a different cider market in the US if we keep keep drinking. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And keep that's- buying those ciders. And it's a good point, Sarah, um, because for those of you who don't know, some of those other styles of apples we were talking about earlier, so the bitter sharps and the bitter sweets and things like that, like there really isn't anything else to do with them other than make cider. Like. You, you know, and I'm sure people have tried many times to make pies out of them and add more sugar and do all the things. But that's one of the reasons a lot of those trees got ripped up in the first place is because when, you know, pro and this is controversial, not everyone agrees with this, but you know, when prohibition hit and there were certain apples that it's like, there's nothing else to do with this other than make it into booze. Of course, they're going to rip those trees out and plant something that they can sell, right? Like, so it makes sense. And so it, that, that's a good point, Sarah, that, you know, it's riskier for the farmers to make these types of apples that there's really just this primary one market, you know, for, um, which we haven't thought about. Hey, Mara and Scott, quickly give us some notes on the grapefruit and tell us a little bit about this yeah. so we can 
pop over to I Hemley. I can't keep my nose out of it. This smells it's so like a fresh cut grapefruit. It like almost shocks you a little bit. Like when you first smell it, you're like, if you're not expecting it, you're yeah. like, oh, that's that's like a little tart and a little funky <laughs> and like grapefruity. And then, but it's really quite lovely. It's like first, like when you dig your nails into the yeah. grapefruit, pull it back. Like that's imagine that. While if, if you don't have one in front of you to smell, that's that's what you're smelling right now. That's your smell of vision until we figure out that technology. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really good to hear. Actually. Um, one of our first year rounds other than dry and semi-sweet was a cider we called Citrus in 2015. Um, we've been working on trying to like nail Citrus down uh, for a long time. And it's, it's like that play between bitterness and sweetness, right? Um, and our original launch was like way too bitter. It was mostly just like the mm -hmm. and the pilt and like there, we had a lot of fans of it but it, it largely went nowhere and like this has been something i've been working on for a couple of years now um trying to get that play between bitterness and juiciness like right um and so that you smell it and it smells like citrus fruit and then still like drinks like you're eating a, a grapefruit right instead of just like sucking on the on the peel right yeah a mouthful of pissed yeah Exactly. In, in the production of this, do you use a lot of zest or is it mostly juice or combination? Yeah, that, that, that's largely what we've been trying to figure out. Okay. Um, initially, we were using only pilt, like dried grapefruit, mm -hmm. just way too bitter for everyone who tried it. And they were just like, that's not grapefruit. It's like, no, that's what grapefruit is, right? <laughs> it's like, it's bitter. I drink. It is, it is that funny thing where at first, Again, if you're not expecting it, when I first smelt it, you can almost like because that that bitter smell can almost come across as like that little that slightly like, oh, is that a little like skunky? Is that a little like that's a little weird? But then once you like orient your brain and you're like, oh, but that is grapefruit and that is OK, that's right. You know, so it, it's a fascinating and especially since a lot of what you taste is what you smell. It's a really, I strongly encourage if anyone's drinking this to pour this into a wine glass because it is like being able to get your nose in there yeah. while you're drinking it really kind of brings the experience all together. It's, it's really fun. I think you could make some really fun cocktails with this too. Oh, oh yeah. and we do. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Any quick suggestions? Uh, this one I'd do a salty dog with. Oh, yeah. fun. That makes total sense. That'd be delicious. Yeah. We're going to do that Definitely. probably tonight. <laughs> Um, it's the like really like super easy margarita where you just like add a little bit of like tequila to it. Or yeah, mezcal. Uh, mm -hmm. Our virtual tasting last week was mezcal, and we have a few nice bottles of that. And so, in fact, we made there we go a cocktail with grapefruit in it. Yeah, so. we did. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool. um, just real quickly, uh, in addition to this flavor, there's some other amazing flavors. I just threw the link to the Seattle Cider Company's shop in the chat box. Um, their basil mint the, is like the, it's unbelievable. My favorite. I don't know when yeah. it's seasonally available, but the basil mint is so good. Uh, oh. The agave pineapple. I think basil mint is always available, right? Is it? Yeah, basil mint is year round. Oh. Hey, That's so good. Caveat about the grapefruit. So we were on our way into our seasonal change. This is actually not our summer cider. Oh. Summer so this is if you find it, if you find the grapefruit somewhere, get it now because it's about to transition if it hasn't already, to Marionberry. Oh, yum. Marionberry. Oh, that's exciting. Uh, this is our newest. This is brand new. This has also been in R&D forever. Um, we're all really thrilled with this. Um, I'm going to pour a little bit so you guys can see the pretty color. And then I actually really can't wait to taste through some of these um, Hemley ciders. They sent us the loveliest package so we could taste through, through some of their things as well. Um, so I'm super excited about that. But that's my actually caveat is that grapefruit is moving on. Uh, it will be back. It'll be back Look at that color places uh, to bring wow. that out. Cool. And, berry, and that's actually the summer seasonal. But it was so new. We hadn't even canned it yet by the time we had started talking about this. Um, wow. And actually, um, shipping is taking like a really long time right now. And I looked at, I was like, how, how can I get cans to you uh, quickly for this? And, but you'd already planned. So I'll send you some for after the fact you can trade. We would love that. Thank you. Very sweet. Yeah. <laughs>
Awesome. Let's everyone, can we all raise a glass and give Mara and Scott a nice cheers from Seattle Cider Company? Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to learn more about your company and your brand and drink these delicious ciders, and I can't wait to make a salty dog. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Sarah. Hi there. So, so everyone, <laughs> I've known Sarah for quite a while. I don't even remember how we met Sarah. Do you? through Brad, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's right. Yeah, so Sarah's done some in-person Meet the Maker events with us, um, which are always fun. And that's kind of, these have been a virtual spin on our Meet the Maker events. Um, and I've had the pleasure of going up to Sarah's farm and orchard. And so they have a really amazing story, Hemley, um, because they honestly, so you were talking earlier about how about 60% of the apples are from Washington especially if you live in the state of California, probably most of the pears that you buy at the grocery store and eat are from Hamley Hamley Farms. Farms, Hamley Farms. Um, and so she has a really fascinating story about a generations old pear farm and you know the, or the tasting room that they just built is right on it. So you get to like be looking at the you know, pears while you're in the orchards and everything. And so it's really, it's up near Sacramento. Um, so it's a great pit stop on your way to Tahoe. Um, <laughs> And it's a really lovely spot when we can all go hang out outside again and it's right off the river and it's just lovely and I love their ciders and um, you know they're this one here so it's funny when we were setting up today and putting these behind us you know Sarah sent us quite a few of all of the different varieties and Evan was like why do we only have one can of that and I was like Ev I can't not drink it when it's in the house like this is like my favorite and I it's just this is like my go to at the end of a day i'm not in the mood for anything like in particular and i'm just like i want to drink and i want to drink that i know i'm going to enjoy and this is just like this easy drinking delicious cider and it's honestly a little sweeter than most ciders that i like just a touch sweeter but for whatever reason it just really drinks clean and deliciously to me so i'm super excited to let sarah tell you a little bit of the hemley story and share all the goodness with all of you Take yeah, well, thanks, Suzanne, and I'm really enjoying this uh, grapefruit cider as well. Thank you for sending it to us. It's really cute. So, we, yeah, we are, um, I, I'm basically a tourist. I married into a sixth-generation pear farming family, and uh, we appreciate pear puns, so go ahead and uh, send us some, because uh, I always get a kick out of that. Like, they're perfect. No, you say pear puns? But we are coming out with Pear puns, yeah, we've got a pandemic t-shirt coming out pretty soon. Oh, he, he yeah, loves so. puns. Yeah, he, he's very punny, so he'll get right to work on that. I love you. that. <laughs> yes. So we, yeah, we, um, the kind of the behind the scenes of the cider was marrying into this pear farming family and discovering pears, essentially, that uh, I went to school in Berkeley and grew up in Sacramento had some background in basically drinking wine and appreciating wine and was blown away by farming in the Delta, by what it takes to be a farmer. Like I had this really romantic view of, oh, you're out in the sun and it's wonderful. And then you come out here and you're like, wow, the, the hard work that's gone into generations of this, seven days a week, um, pear trees never disappear. You can't take vacations there. They're, they work really hard. And it's, it's cool to think about the trees that we use for our fruit have been growing out here since 1850. And then if you think about it, if you've had a pear, if your parents have had a pear, if your great grandparents and your great great grandparents have had pears, odds are they've had pears from the trees that are growing out here. The history of that farming and um, the way that you ripen fruit. And I, I think my sister-in-law has the best story about pears being the most human of all fruits because they are just little assholes most of the time. <laughs> they are, they're extremely difficult to grow. Um, they are hard to harvest. They are hard to ripen. They're hard to pack. They're hard to make into cider. But if you get that piece of fruit, all right, here's a good analogy. It's comparing an apple to a pear. So you go to the grocery store and you buy an apple and you buy a pear. So when you pick an apple that's at its perfect ripest off the tree, you can eat it whatever time you want to. It's kind of it's easy. If you, um, the pear, you take it home. It's not ripe. It's not perfect. In 
yeah, you, you, you have to pull it. It's, it's on its own schedule. And I'm not sure. Oh, okay, cool. I don't have to look at myself anymore. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's also yeah, true, so Sarah, like with pears, it's like, you know, I love pears, but when I bring them home, it's like, you have to really keep an eye on them because they'll be too, too firm and you don't want to eat it then. And then you look away for a minute and now it's too ripe and it's mealy. And you're just like, damn it. No, I it's not a perfect spot. Like, so they're very persnickety. Yeah. Persnickety. They're, they're very persnickety. I did one. Yeah. Yeah. They don't care about you or your schedule. It's when they're <laughs> ready, they're ready. And but when sure. you catch it in that right moment, it's perfect. That's kind of what we were trying to capture with the cider. And it's all about the fruit and the people that grow the fruit and the work that goes behind it and knowing that when we make the cider that we have to pay tribute to all of that hard work that goes into growing this fruit and that's um so when you open our cider what we really want you to do is to taste and experience that perfect ripe pear and have just become a part of that story and know where this fruit is coming from and as we've transitioned and grown with the company we started out with the pears and then um we're right now pressing cherries from our neighbor and it's so it's happened that we're finding that the outlets for some of these fruits like pears and some of the apples um, coming out of California with the canning industries collapsing with transition in um, cold storage technology with chili with China coming in on the market there isn't as many outlets for a lot of these fruits and that's where cider as an industry is can step in and have that extra outlet for these fruits. Sure. And that's what we're, we're starting to partner with different growers and, and trying to find, making sure that we, we learn the fruit and that we know where it comes from. We know how they grow it, how it's harvested, who the people are, and then treating that fruit and then trying to bring that um, to uh, the consumer so that everybody can experience and drink it and be healthy and yeah help save the planet by keeping these trees in the ground, right? Yeah, for sure. Hey, Sarah, this is a nice old picture. I'm just going to pause here for a minute. I don't normally have people talk to the exact pictures, but this is a nice picture of the, the still family home that you guys have. And I know when I was up there, you told me a really fun story about how this is the only home that's on the river because some funny thing, or I, I don't know, remember the exact story, but I, I just thought maybe you could talk a little bit about the history since it is you know, the fact that you guys have owned this orchard and been doing this since the 1850s, like, it's, it's crazy, you know? Um, so I would love for you just to tell a little bit of that history. Yeah, I got to tell the donkey story then, because yeah, this is, the that's my story. favorite story. <laughs> yeah. So this is a um, family home that was built by George Beckman Green by hand with tools that he had on his own, that he had made on his own. Whoa. Crazy then. Um, so that's as you can you see this. Then, right? You didn't, you didn't have a home yeah. depot. <laughs> like, and where they're standing right now is the road and then in front of them would be the road and then the levee that goes onto the river and just down river in the town of Cortland there was a bar and their neighbor lived up river and the neighbor would go to the bar every night and get really drunk and then he would get on his donkey because they had auto um, GF, GPS donkeys back then the donkey would then walk up the road and stop in front of this hedge and eat the hedge and it made great great grandfather so mad that he took his horse and shovel and moved the road behind the house so now to this day it is the only house on the river that actually goes up against the river and doesn't have the road in front of it because when they built the levees they took the levees and built them on the road and all the houses are behind the levees except for this house <laughs> so it's amazing they still you know the, the family still lives there and so i got to go kind of see this when i was up visiting sarah and it's one of these, like, you almost feel like you're in the South because they have this beautiful, like, wraparound porch, and then it's just, like, the, the river, like, right there in their, like, backyard, and it's just really quite beautiful, um, and it's funny that it's, like, literally the only house around that has that luxury because of the donkey story. <laughs> Thank goodness for that donkey. The drunk neighbor drunk on the donkey. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of what it looks like today. Right, yeah, it's, it's a... The whole community is basically, you know, the same as it always has been, kind of trapped in, not trapped, but suspended in farming. Yeah. And one of the, re the, the cool reasons that, so, so Cortland area is the largest concentrated pear growing area in the world. And one of the reasons that pears were so successful there is we, well, we, in Sacramento, before the levees, the whole area would flood during the winter. 
Um, and pears are one of the few trees that can take a little bit of submersion. They can't survive submerged for long, but they can take the flooding that is common in Sacramento and our high water tables. And so they were successful down there and um, people planted a lot of pears. But unfortunately with canning going away, uh, a lot of the pears are getting ripped up now for grapes. And so we're working as hard as we can to save that. Yeah. Noble cause. For sure. As much as I like grapes. And it is, <laughs> it is really beautiful. I really encourage anyone who, as you're driving up to Tahoe, to do a little pit stop up here when, when we can all do those types of things again and hang out at the pacing room. Because it's just really cool. It's, it's, it's like when you go to a winery and it's right in the vineyard. You know, yeah. it's really cool to kind of be surrounded by pear trees and, you know, be sipping on delicious cider. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, Sarah, there was a question that came up earlier that I thought would be a good one to direct to you. Uh, you know, you're talking about pears being very fickle and, and, you know, much more challenging compared to apples, but even with apples, um, you know, the fruit gets ripe and is harvested once a year. And as a producer that's trying to meet demand of the consumer as a, you know, as a cider producer, um, how do you do that with, you know, the apples, uh, especially if you're making something from your estate like you are, uh, to be able to, I guess, properly store the fruit so that this, uh, so that the cider is fresh or, um, or just make it all and then hold on to it and bottle it as it needs to be bottled. Uh, you know, what, what is the process that, that you guys do there at Henley? So process we do is um, our fruit, we're kind of in this unusual area where we are the first in the Northern Hemisphere to harvest. And that's where kind of the business plan of Green and Hemley, which is our um, farming company, took off where we have a two week window before Washington harvest hits and buries the market. So we harvest for, we don't harvest for shelf life. We harvest for those two weeks. So we have a different type of fruit essentially. Okay. Uh, we have to press all that fruit. We, be, we do grow different varieties. So um, we can cold store uh, the Bartlett pears until about January. So all of our pressing has to be done by if we're pushing it to January. Apples, end of apple season is about the end of October for us. And so, yeah, we're, we're done pressing by January and then we have um, our ferments going and most of our fermentations take a minimum of 10 weeks before we can bottle it. So we'll, we'll you know, we, we have to time things. The other way that you can do that is a lot of, um, some of the other fruit growers can grow their fruit for shelf life and then you can store them in um, where they basically have these special storage, it, uh, most of it's in Washington where they'll, I, I, my understanding is it, it's a different atmosphere that they store it in. Hmm. And then they can store those for over a year to two years, I believe, wow. depending on the fruit. And then you can pull that out of um, cold storage and press it year round if it's coming from, but they are different, different quality of fruit. I do, I do feel like I had a recollection of apples being, you know, among the storage. types of yeah. food that you can store if they're in the right conditions. And that makes sense that it would be something with the, the pressure in the room and maybe even, you know, the, the type of gas that is in the air, like, you know, the composition of the atmosphere as opposed to just what the pressure of the atmosphere is. Um, yeah. I think that they can last that long. I had no idea. Yeah, they, you can kind of tell when you go to the grocery store and you look at the stem, if the stem is dried, most likely it's been cold stored for some time. So you're eating a different, an older apple. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. It's a good trick. Hey Sarah, yeah. tell us about your, tell us about your original. So the, the original, the original pair really off here. <laughs> what our pot, our process? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, this was your original. So yeah, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about when you first started making cider and kind of what, you know, because I do think, so for those of you who haven't, so Perry's are 100% pear. These are pear ciders because there is some apple in them as well. Um, and what I love about them, because I do find pear ciders and Perry's alike, I often find them to be kind of cloyingly sweet. 
you know, where they have a little, like that, that viscosity a little bit where it's like, just like too sweet for me and yours, whatever your process is, just don't do that. And I know there's like different sugars between pears and apples and all that kind of jazz. So yeah, tell us a little bit about it and tell us about this original pear that a few of us are sipping on too. Yeah, so pears are, like we are saying, a little bit different than apples. One of the primary sugar in pears is sorbitol. It's an unfermentable sugar. We also, when we press, the bricks come in, so we, we, we get a maximum of about 6% alcohol, and then our pH comes in at about 4.2. So as we found out uh, what, when we started doing this is we are, it's basically varsity level winemaking. We're on the edge of destruction every single day as we produce this with pears uh, because we don't have a high alcohol content and um, we are really susceptible to bacterial infections. But if we can nail it and get it right, I think it's amazing. And again, the goal was to make a balanced product that highlights the pear and one that I wanted to drink because uh, I liked beer and wine before I got into cider and wanted something that was balanced that I could drink as well. So that's where we got lucky in meeting um, Chris Thompson, who was in a slide from Tasmania, was a whiskey and cider maker down in Tasmania. And the two of us connected and came up with this, this style of making cider, which is we press, um, we just switched this year. We were pressing galas with Bartlett's, but um, this year we started Bartlett and Boss, so it's now full Perry. Oh. But the blend of a uh, little bit of the Boss got a little tannin and a little acid, and the Bartlett are a lot of sweet. Um, and then a little different botanicals. So then we go through, we use two different wine yeasts, um, fermented out, then it goes through a malolactic fermentation, which can give it a little bit more of a butter beer mouthfeel. And then age it in oak chips for a minimum of four weeks. And sometimes it'll take a little bit longer because it is like wine. Each harvest is a little different. As we're fermenting, the temperatures outside will vary as uh, how long we're going to hold it in tank. So there's a lot of nuance and craft into making cider just like there is in wine. And then again, so that, that gives us a, a wine, essentially a pear wine. And then what makes it that cider is when we do a second press, a fresh press Bartlett and Bosque. And then we blend back a little bit of fresh press juice into the cider to make it, give it that little sweetness and smoothness. But we're not, at, we never add any sugar, which is, or concentrate, nothing from concentrate. It's just all that natural juice back in there. It's all unfiltered. And then um, we sterile pasteurize it add carbonation and then can and keg it. We used to bottle, but now we're canning. Are you gonna, are you not bottling at That's, all anymore? Are you only doing cans now? We're doing a little bit of bottling as we need it, but the, yeah, the stores no longer want to take bottles. They want cans, so. Interesting. We're, we're canning. <laughs> so wait, I'm gonna have to do a side-by-side, -side, huh? I didn't know you had changed your, if you would have told me before that you were changing and moving some of the apple out and only doing pear, I would have been very nervous because this is my favorite. But the fact that I didn't notice is a very good sign. <laughs> Are there benefits that you find to, to canning or bottling in terms of, uh, in terms of flavor or um, in, like consumption? Well, we know with the, uh, with the pear, it does age pretty well. So, We've seen in the bottle that we can get some pretty interesting things going on even after two years. Oh. Um, we don't know what it's going to do in a can. So mm. Remains to be seen, huh? Yeah, so we'll see. I'm hoping that the cans age well, but yeah, we have high hopes for it. <laughs> so now let's move on over to, this is the one that Evan really loves to sip on, is the hot, and I, I enjoy it quite a bit as well, but he, He's a little bit spicier than Some I am. Some hot, hot those. heat for the summer, summer time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the jalapeno, Sarah, first of all, what even gave you the idea of doing a jalapeno pear cider? The jalapeno is actually, um, I don't, have you heard of Troy Cider? Yes. So he, yeah, he was, um, he used to ride around on a motorcycle in Sonoma and find random trees that were growing in Sonoma and then press them and ferment them out. And he found this amazing peri pear, and he fermented it out. And when I tasted it, it naturally had hints of that um, green pepper to it—not the burn, but the pepper. And, and you can get that a lot in winemaking as well. 
And when I tasted that, that was again like, wow, let's see if we can play with this and bring, I thought it kind of tied things together. And then we started playing with the green jalapenos in the cidery and blending it. And it really, I think, ties everything together. It's not there to burn you up. It's just, it, it's again, focusing on making that complete beverage and uh, something that you're gonna take a couple different sips of and drink again and it goes really well with food and it's a good, it's a good everyday drinker, but it, it's bringing those natural elements back. And unfortunately, that tree, we tried to go find it and it, uh, it's gone. It got plowed under for grapes as well. Oh. We're looking for Perry. We, we found some good Perry trees that we're, we're working on. Julia. Very nicely framed, and uh, yeah, I, I applaud that. the a, a camera adjustment there so that- To get the cans in the, <laughs> in the screen, we love it. We love that. <laughs> um, Sarah, I have to ask you, because I have had this now in both the can and the bottle, and as much as I loved it in the bottle, I feel like this is just a one step more dialed in, and so kudos, first of all, but what did you, did you change something or is it my imagination? And if so, what, what did you change? Well, everything we do, we do in thousand gallon batches. And every single time we do it, again, we try to do it a little better um, than my dog. But, yeah. And with the jalapenos, we grow the jalapenos ourselves as well. And then each of those batches is different. So it's every time we're blend, it's playing with the blend and fixing okay. it. So. On the cans now, we, we were able to put, um, this one says jalapeno business, because we're so clever. So each can now <laughs> has its own. Yes. <laughs> so when you find a blend that you like, then you know, that's, that's from oh. that same batch code. Okay, cool. So that's a good way to keep track of what batch. Mm, perfect. Did this, have, yeah. um, did this have apples in it before as well? It did, and the, yeah, the apples are all gone now. No okay. more apples. Cool. Yeah, this is really fun. Um, we love this with, I mean, not surprisingly, like Mexican food. And we, we eat a lot of Mexican food here. And so this is like super fun yeah. on taco night and things like that. Because the sweetness is nice too. That There's a little bit of sweetness, it but really, then with the spice. It like, really does make for a very balanced beverage. And uh, actually, there was a suggestion earlier. Um, I don't know if Kristen's oh, still yeah, on Kristen, here. Oh, yeah, Kristen, yeah. She's enjoying the jalapeno hemli with some popcorn that has sriracha salt on it. Which sounds which, delicious. Well, that's good. I mean, yeah, I, I like that. He needs a salty dog, and I need some popcorn with sriracha. We have salt dinner. On it yeah, we have our dinner plans. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, this is um, for those of you who haven't tried this yet. Yeah, it's it's a fun one, and it's you know any any time we ever introduce anyone to it, they're like jalapeno, and they always do the. And then they try it and they're like, oh, all right, I get it. Like that makes it's it's good. So it's yeah, it's a fun one for sure. Um, and it was when, when we first started it and I was Skyping back to uh, Tasmania and the guys back there were saying, don't do that. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. And then we did it. And then they got, they came over to the U.S. and tasted it. And they got even angrier because they loved it. So <laughs> Yeah, that would make me really infuriated too if I was like, no, no, no. I love it. Dang it. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> For sure. Hey, Sarah, I want to give you a cheers, too. Thank you so much for sharing your ciders with us and your fun story and you guys keeping us flush in pairs for a lot, very long time. Yeah, <laughs> the great state of California. Thanks, thanks for you and your family for your, your pears, and we thank you for your Perry ciders, and yeah. especially this jalapeno one for me, and I know that you're going to love it. Yeah, for sure. Another. And if we... um. Oh, look, and Lisa and Sterling are saying that it's legitimately the first flavored cider that they've enjoyed, so. The jalapeno that, uh, one? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's right, cool. Um, they live in California, awesome. they haven't tried Seattle Cider Company yet, so they can't say that. So well, once we get, Cal California shipping, you guys, for cider all of a sudden is like a disaster. For a while, we were cool with it, and now, like, shipping cider yeah, to California. Yeah, it's not any like, cidery's fault. It's just California's fault, just yeah. in case anyone's curious. It, like, overnight, <laughs> it's just all of a sudden became very difficult to ship cider to California, so it's real, really annoying. We would be remiss if we didn't also mention the other, yeah. the other couple of products in Sarah's line. Um, there is the Pink Lady. Oh, 
from that there, which is made from pink lady apples, which if you ever had in the store, um, this makes for a really nice apple cider. Yeah. And then this is a drier style of the brute pear. And Sarah, is that the same as the original? It just really is fermented drier? Or is it different? Yeah, there's no back sweetening. Okay. Yeah. But it, with pear, you're, yeah, you'll always have a little bit of an RS taste to it, even though it's fermented dry because of the sorbitol. So when you get like a real peri, it can blow champagne out of the water. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it is, it is a fun one for like just that bubble. Um, yeah, so we'll throw the links in one more time so you guys know where to get these. And especially I know, Sarah, the tasting pack that we had for tonight was looking like it was like 15% off currently. So that's grab your cider now. You can, you know, um, she's, Tomlee's in California. So if you're in California, you're in luck and you can get it shipped right to you. And I don't know if you saw, um, Helen, who is here, she posted a picture on our event page when she got the Hemley package because it was so cute. And it's, Pat and what Mara was saying it earlier too, it's kind of like a cardboard box with some like filling in it. And then she actually sent a little mask with it as well. Um, so it's a very sweet package. Very um, nice gesture. Very yeah. thoughtful. Yeah. So grab your ciders because these are really fun and they are as the weather gets warmer. These are awesome to sip on. As Mara was saying earlier, I know all of us are actually beer lovers, um, and so, but this is nice when you just like, you want to feel a little lighter, and you don't want to feel a little bloated, and you want to like, you know, that's one, that is one of the benefits of cider beyond being delicious, is that you just feel a little cleaner and lighter and healthier when you're drinking it as well. Um, and these blood orange seltzers, and then also, I think we mentioned there's the Meyer lemon seltzer as well. These are awesome, so no more white claw guys these are your new <laughs> i'm just gonna say it sorry no more put the white claw down and get these <laughs> um these they are really fun and they're delicious um and they they give you the same benefit of light and low calorie and low sugar and yeah. all that good stuff um so yeah but thank you everyone for joining us we were had there any last yeah. questions anybody else have something that they'd like to to say or for uh, any questions before we, before we cut, cut you all off. Yeah, we're always happy to stick around and chit chat. So if you do have some questions, throw yeah, them our way. True. We're not um, gonna cut you off. <laughs> I'm a talker. Evan likes these because it lets me talk to other people instead of talking to him all the time, so. <laughs> but we don't wanna keep any of you. If you um, can't stay. Especially, you know, our, our lovely hosts for, for joining us or, or uh, you know, if you have dinner to cook, anything like that, um, well, let's, we, at the we very least, let's at the very least do one more last cheers and yes. thank you all for joining. To all of you, from all of us. Yay cider. Yay cider. Summer sipping cider. Summer <laughs> vacation cider. <laughs>